What is religion? What is science? What makes a religion spread? What makes science spread? The answers to these questions will provide us with an insight on why religion and science are deeply incompatible with each other, and why science is a better tool than religion in order to explore our moral and spiritual dimension. So, let's begin from the origin of these two cultural phenomena. We have seen in the last video that language is the biological bridge through which our species has reached a new level of complexity. In fact, natural selection, thanks to our capacity for language, made our brain hardwired to be softwired. This basically means that we keep on evolving not much from a biological point of view, but rather dramatically from a cultural point of view at a rate far more rapid than any form of biological evolution ever before. Welcome to the evolution of our mind. The human brain appeared on the Earth some five million years ago. It took just a few million more to fully mature a mere blink on the geological timescale. Structurally, anatomically, the human brain hasn't changed much in about 200,000 years. It's the same brain used by the first Homo sapiens to walk the planet. But what has evolved is the mind, and it's this inner universe that has so mystified and beguiled us. The mind, together with the brain, forms the most complex system known to man. At the dawn of the 21st century, we are slowly crossing the borders of this last frontier, so that we may understand better who we are, why we create, imagine, and invent, why our fears haunt us, our thoughts liberate where we prove our free will, our sense of self, and express our inner voice. In this video we will begin to explore human culture as a product of natural selection. Maybe we should use the term cultural evolution to distinguish it from the biological one. For example, native spoken language is a biological adaptation, but not the ability to read and write. But in any case, the biological and cultural levels are deeply intertwined and interconnected. Therefore, if we want to understand our mental life, we must begin to know how much of it is hardwired, innate, and how much of it is the product of culture, of language. And as we have seen in the previous videos, scientists ask babies in order to pull these features apart and try to figure out what are the basic components of human nature. Developmental psychology tells us that children are native dualist, egocentric, but are also endowed by an innate sense of morality. And children are especially likely to assign a purpose to everything. Children are native teleologists. Besides, children develop self-awareness by the first two years. All these characteristics have developed because they represent an evolutionary advantage. Now, when we add the language to self-awareness, something new happens. Just in the same way we can use language to investigate language itself, we invented the grammar, human mind is able to focus self-awareness on itself, and this generates differently from Akas in chimpanzee and orangutans, which are capable of self-awareness as well, a huge problem for us. Our teleological nature demands a meaning to our own existence. And we have ways of analyzing reality that are very easily misapplied, such as thinking that evolution must be something that, that has a purpose, uh, in the same way that we have a purpose. Our purpose is so um, 
endemic in our, in our human life and our social life. Indeed, we use it to make sense of each other's behavior. Why did John just get on a bus? Well, it's not because there was some big magnet that pulled yeah. him up. It's because he wanted to get somewhere and he knew the bus would take him there, which is why he won't get on the bus if it has a slightly different number. Uh, that kind of explanation is indispensable to our common sense social life. When we misapply it to questions like, why are there humans? Why is there a uh, planet Earth? We're apt to be misled and have to be, have to have that debugged. Yes. Who am I? What shall I do of my life? These are fundamental questions that every normal human being must answer explicitly or implicitly at some point in life. Differently from a chimpanzee, we cannot live simply using our instinct. Rather, a human baby must learn how to become an adult. A purposeless process like natural selection have created a species that intrinsically seeks a meaning to its own existence. But this paradox, this incredible accident, was favored by natural selection because it creates an unstable situation which is not only a problem but also a great opportunity at the same time. It is the thing that propels our progress. After all, in order to walk, we must create a transitory moment of instability between two following steps. Closely related to this matter, there is also the need that some human beings feel so deeply to make a difference and not to waste one's life. Whereas other human beings, as a matter of fact the majority of them, feel the need to conform instead. Within this range, between the sparkle of the single individual and the obscurity of the mass, every one of us must find the meaning to one's own life. Randy, you and I are both Darwinians, obviously, but you're a medical doctor and I'm not. Mm. It's always struck me that a lot of medical doctors don't seem quite to have caught up 150 years after the origin. Is that your impression too? They're all very interested once they find out about it, um, but very few doctors have had a chance to get an education in evolutionary biology, and boy, do I ever wish I had <laughs> yes. uh, when I was uh, to getting my medical education. There are so many things that would have made a lot more sense if someone had just really explained how natural selection works. There are some doctors who feel, well, all I need to do then is to learn about a lot of other animals as though I was a vet, but it's not quite like that, is it? No, we really need to know where they all came from and why they're all designed in ways that make things go wrong. So you use the word design there, and yes. um, we need, to, obviously, to interpret that in a special Darwinian sense of You know, design. I always end up using the word design, and someone in the audience always said, you shouldn't do that, Dr. Nessie, because yeah. uh, you don't really mean design, and they're absolutely right, of course. Well, yeah, but... We've grown out of that now, haven't we? Or have we not? But when you look at how the mechanisms of the body work, it's almost automatic to talk about them being designed. But really gives the proof is when you look at how badly designed they are. No sensible person would have ever left the body the way it is. Like what? What's a good example of that? Um, name your part of the body that you want to. Um, probably a lot of people watching this uh, show have been on a skateboard. And for instance, they fall like this and they break these bones here. The doctors call it a collie's fracture. If you look on the skeleton, it's these two bones fracture right there. Now, people have been falling down like that for, you know, a million years, or our predecessors have. Why didn't natural selection make these bones thicker? And the answer is this. We can do this marvelous thing of rotating our arms all the way around like that. I won't do it for this model because it's a Victorian skeleton. It's quite <laughs> delicate. But notice how those bones go across oh, yeah. each other. If those bones were thicker, it would be more like this. And then you yeah. couldn't throw. You, yeah. you, so it's a trade-off, isn't it? Now, this is something that any machine would be limited by. But when they make robots, they still are not using two different firm rods usually. There's usually one that rotates. OK, so it's, a, it's kind of historical legacy then. That's the other part of it. Yes, yes exactly. Historical legacy. We, the technical word term is path dependence. It's all the same. Yeah. Probably a lot of viewers have a keyboard for their computer. In fact, we all have what's called a QWERTY keyboard. And that keyboard was designed specifically to keep typewriter keys from sticking. And so they put all the vowels a fair way away from each other, so there was a little delay. Well, this means we all type slowly because our keyboards are designed to make us type There are slowly. better designs of keyboards. There are. What's, what's it called? The Dvorak. Uh, yes. And mm -hmm. once you've learned how to do it, uh, y you go faster, don't you? You first. 
Uh, I would the, the time it takes exactly, to learn. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I'll never do that. I don't. I think the world may be stuck with yes. these mal-designed keyboards for another hundred years, just because they started off that way, and the cost of changing is too high for all of us, so we're stuck with it. Likewise, there are all kinds of aspects of the body that might be done differently, but uh, we've gone down one particular path and can't get out of it. I mean, the example I like to use with machines is: imagine if you had to evolve the jet engine from the propeller engine by changing it one little step at a time. Not possible. Well, or if you did, you have a pretty lousy jet engine. Exactly so. Time. Everything in the body, once you take an evolutionary view, is trade-offs all the way down. So is our mental life, the result of a trade-off. Natural selection has shaped our species in order to force us to find a meaning to our life, even if we risk to live unhappy lives if we are not able to find or create such a meaning. More to this point, a lot of men and women in the past had had to fight their way out of darkness. But the theory of evolution doesn't work to maximize our happiness, but only to create trade-offs. And in fact, we are able to build our complex societies because we have the burden to give a meaning to our life. No one is born artist, or scientist, or teacher, or any of the other innumerable roles that are necessary to advance our societies. Rather, we prepare ourselves to live in society since we are children. Sometimes we are able to invent our particular role, but in any case we must give our contribution to society if we want to survive and reproduce, because outside of human societies there is no possibility for a living. A concept in harmony with Darwin's dangerous idea. If you could have a number of guests around your ultimate dinner table, living or dead, well, one would have to be Darwin. Maybe Jesus. Find out what really happened. I'm hostile to religion because it, it teaches people to be satisfied with non-explanations or, or poor explanations or outdated explanations for things. And that's been one of my motivations all, all my career, really. As a scientist, I care passionately about the wonderful opportunity that we all have to really understand the world, the universe, life, humanity, where we come from, what it all means. At least part of what religion has always been about is providing answers to those questions. Science provides what I believe to be a closer approximation to the correct answers. And so science is our best shot at understanding things. I adopt a distinction which the philosopher Daniel Dennett proposed between what he calls skyhooks and cranes. A crane is an explanation that really does explanatory work. And natural selection, Darwinian natural selection, is the, is the big crane. That's the one that really does explain the complexity of life. A skyhook is a non-explanation. It's something a great hand reaches out, in the, out of the sky. Anybody who tries to explain something by saying, oh, well, it's due to a spirit, or it's due to a magic spell, that's a skyhook. There are people who think that to postulate something complex is a real explanation. You're left asking, well, where does the skyhook come from? Where does the magic come from? Who controls the magic? Natural selection, Darwinian natural selection, is not only a very, very powerful crane, it also is very good at raising consciousness about the power of cranes generally. And in fact, the Darwinian perspective can help us understand better our spiritual life. For example, it makes us understand that there is not a pre-written destiny, an ultimate end to reach, a plan to fulfill, a God that directs everything and to which we can entrust our future, but rather the contrary. It is us that must give a meaning, that must create a direction, that must develop our future. We are responsible for all the things that we do, for which we cannot blame any devil, neither we can praise any god. Now, if we could invite Jesus into this discussion, where will he possibly sit? Near the skyhook or among the cranes? The answer to this question will be one of the main themes of this series of videos. Anyway, 
In the next video we will see that the need to find a meaning to human life and awareness of the inevitability of death are at the base of religion. But religion doesn't provide humanity with an efficient answer, although it has the capacity to spread as a malicious virus. Thank you for watching.